We are one family in Jesus Christ. Amen. What a privilege to see all of you here. Those of you in the balcony, thank you for being here. Those of you here on the main floor, here in Indianapolis, in the Warren Performing Arts Center. Indianapolis is a magnificent, well-known city all over the world. In fact, this weekend, it is really well known. The Indy 500 will take place tomorrow. Exciting events. People are preparing. But the good news is, you are here today preparing for an event even greater than the Indy 500. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for every one of you, young people, those of you in the balcony, here, and those of you receiving this by live streaming all over this globe, coming to you from Indianapolis, in Indiana, in the United States. Pastor Finley had a marvelous talk this morning, helping us to understand the final events and the coming of Jesus Christ. The understanding that his second coming, Christ's second coming, will not be a quiet event, it will be an audible event. It will not be something which will be unseen in a secret place, it will be seen by every eye. It will come with a shout, with a proclamation, with the trumpet of God. What a wonderful introduction to the topic that we're going to look at right now, which is to help us understand the lead up to this amazing second coming of Jesus Christ. We had a wonderful baptism already this morning. Wasn't that sweet? Wasn't that precious? A grandmother and a granddaughter united in Christ. We're going to have another baptism, three people, at the end of this presentation. And many of you have made decisions already for Christ. We had a number of people, when those cards were turned in, people who have decided to follow Jesus in baptism. And I'll give you another opportunity to solidify that decision and any others who are longing to be ready for Jesus soon coming. The topic for this hour is one which a lot of people have questions about. Why are there so many denominations? What is it that fractures us and doesn't seem to pull us together. I'll tell you right now, this precious word, the written word, representing Jesus, the living word, pulls us together because it contains all truth. So this morning, as we focus on this subject, I want you to understand that it will all come from the Word of God. You know, have you ever kind of wondered if there's one God, one Bible, one Jesus, why is it that there are so many denominations, so many different groups in the world? In fact, <laughs> there are thousands of different church groups worldwide. Indeed, an individual might be very bewildered, confused about why there are so many churches. They don't really understand. One God, one Bible, one Jesus, but thousands of different churches? What is the answer to this question? Well, a bigger question is which one of these churches is the right one? 
Have you ever wondered, well, how can I really truly find the truth? We know from Scripture that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. So why are there so many denominations? Well, here's a secret. You do not go to a church to find out what truth is. You go to the Bible to find out what truth is. Then you find a church teaching in harmony with the Holy Word of God. So if you had to search the teachings of every single church, you'd probably be looking through thousands of denominations and different church groups. And that would take you a lifetime. And in the end, maybe you'd still be likely confused about conflicting statements from different churches. So never go to a church to discover what is truth. You go to the Bible. Now you'll recall we have used this before. I'd like you, in fact you sounded really good, Pastor Finley got you involved in reading right from the screen. I'd like you to read this with me, all right? Let's begin. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. So the Bible is central in all that we must discover. Bible prophecy clearly reveals why there are so many denominations. God has particularly revealed the answer to our question about why so many denominations in the book of Revelation, it shares that with us. When you turn in the Bible to Revelation, and we've been focusing on that in our Revelation of Hope seminars, chapter 6 of Revelation, there is that marvelous vision of the four horsemen that gallop across the sky. Now, I don't know if you have noticed some of these beautiful paintings on the sides of the auditorium. Here we have in the first one, Daniel chapter 2, that amazing uh, prediction that we talked about in one of our earliest lectures. And then on this side, a sinner coming to Jesus, which is what all of us need to do, the redeemed in heaven. In fact, you will not want to miss tonight's lecture. Tonight is about that glorious time when all of us, by the grace of God, will be in heaven with our Lord and Savior. Heaven. Come tonight to learn about heaven. But this particular one over here, you might have wondered, what is that all about? Someone, a commanding person, on a beautiful white horse. Well, Revelation chapter 6 is going to tell us about this amazing understanding. You see, God has revealed the history of Christianity more clearly than in any other place in Revelation 6. He's revealed the history of Christianity from the first century in the days of Christ right down to the 21st century in, when, in which we find ourselves right now. And he's revealed how Christianity would begin as one movement, one body, and then would break into varying denominations. He explains why those denominations would emerge. And this is one of the most fascinating, one of the most exciting prophecies in the entire Holy Word. Revelation chapter 6. So here we have Revelation's four horsemen. They represent four successive ages in the history of the church. Now the author of this prophecy, the one that opens the seals of this prophecy, is Jesus Christ himself. 
Revelation 6 and verse 1, let's look at it. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now who is, who is this? All right. Jesus, the Lamb of Revelation. So Jesus gives us now the history of Christianity. Now Revelation 6 continues. And it says... And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. Verse 2, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Now remember, previously, just in the last phrase, it says, this voice was like thunder. Come and see. This is something God wants you to understand today. A white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Pastor Finley mentioned this particular horse and the rider this morning in his presentation. You see, there are four horses that gallop across the sky, one right after the other. When Jesus opens these seals, he shows church history in phases. The first period is represented by a white horse. As Pastor Finley mentioned, white is a symbol of purity. And the one riding that horse, wearing a crown, is Jesus himself. He goes out conquering and to conquer. Now the first phase of the Christian church is pictured as a rider on a white horse triumphing and conquering all the forces of evil. And that's what that horse in this beautiful panel represents over to your right side as you look at it. The white horse represents a powerful, pure faith. In the New Testament, God's truth triumphed. From A.D. 31, after the death of Christ, to A.D. 100, the disciples preached the truth of God's word powerfully through the power of the Holy Spirit. One Roman writer wrote the following. It's an amazing statement. You Christians are everywhere. You are in our armies, in our navies, you are in the marketplace and the shops, you are in our Senate and universities. You are everywhere. You see, the New Testament church grew very rapidly. Nothing could stop the progress of Christianity in the first century. Like a white horse, victorious, this white horse is conquering and pushing and moving forward. And the Christian church galloped across the sky. The power of the gospel could not be stopped. When men and women do not compromise truth in their own life, the, the power of the church is very real. God cannot sanctify error. The powerful New Testament church, armed with the truth of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, made an impact on the Roman world. But now the scene changes. The second seal is opened. A red horse gallops across the sky. The fourth verse in Revelation 6 says, Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take 
peace from the earth and that people should kill one another and there was given to him a great sword let's get the picture now Satan saw that he could not stop this triumphal church represented by that galloping white horse it was triumphing everywhere he had to do something so he began a fierce era of bloody persecution he influenced political leaders to viciously persecute the Christians so the red horse represents a bloody faith we showed this picture previously the Colosseum in Rome Christians were thrown to the lions Christians were persecuted you see a white horse represents a powerful pure truth the red horse in the second seal represents a blood stained faith so from the year AD 100 to the year AD 313 the Christians were persecuted terribly in the blood stained faith period so the white horse apostolic power and purity the red horse a blood-stained faith now where the white horse represents a church triumphant the red horse represents a church persecuted but the church continues to grow Satan persecuted it but he couldn't stop it one early Christian writer wrote the following which is an amazing admission of the power of God in the church he said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the gospel the more you persecute us the more we grow you see people standing for their faith people who were martyred in the name of Jesus were a witness and a testimony to so many others the church grew they they said those people must have something I need to know it it must be the truth so Satan changed the strategy from persecution to something else and let me tell you the devil is like a roaring lion the Bible says going around who he will devour beware stand on the Lord's side and let the Lord defend you when the devil shows up at your door well so Satan changed the strategy from persecution to something else and what was that a third horse gallops across the sky this black horse it represented the period of AD 313 to AD 538 let's read in verse 5 when he opened the third seal I heard the third living creature say come and see so I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand after 200 years of persecution Satan used a different model because what he was using was not working the Christian church kept growing the blood of Christians is seed so his new strategy and let me tell you he's using that today in the church outside of the church in your life in my life trying to bring about compromise okay you give a little I'll give a little let's not worry exactly about all the fine things about truth let's just make it a bit fuzzy don't worry let's all get together beware my friends here in Indianapolis and around the world beware of compromise 
So his master strategy was, and this was an amazing way in which he went about it, was to bring pagan practices into the church. So as the white horse, depicted in this beautiful panel over on your right side, represents purity, the black horse in Revelation represents compromise and error coming into the church. So this black horse represents the period in church history from 313 to 538 AD. The Apostle Paul was concerned about the compromises in his own day. In Acts 20, 29 and 30, we read what Paul said. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. So wolves who attack a beautiful pasture full of a flock or a group of sheep, these wolves would come into the church and they would destroy. You see, the teachings of men would be substituted for the teachings of God himself. My friends in Indianapolis, right here in this Performing Arts Center, do not be deceived by someone who tells you something which is not in accordance with the Word of God. In this period, religious leaders arose teaching perverse, crooked, deviating things. By compromise, the church became large and had political power, but it was weak spiritually. Human tradition would take the place of the primacy of the Holy Word of God, the Bible. Now that's a very important point for you to remember. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So where would truth be cast down? To the ground. You see, in the black horse period, during the fourth and fifth centuries of this globe, truth would be cast down to the ground. It would be put down. Human tradition would be put up. Church history reveals that this prophecy is absolutely rock-solid true. In the book, The Development of Christian Doctrine, page 372, the very famed Christian historian said the following. We are told by Eusebius that Constantine, now, Constantine was the emperor of the Roman Empire. In order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred, now this is the emperor, all right? This is the emperor, done for political reasons. The emperor transferred into the outward, transformed it or transferred it into the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. So what did Constantine do? He was the pagan Roman emperor. And he, what did he want to do? He wanted to unite all of the empire, including Christians. And so he recommended Christianity to the heathens because he needed their support to strengthen his empire as he was fighting the invading barbarian tribes. And how could he do that? Well, he transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own pagan religion. 
the Bible gave way to superstitious traditions. The priests took up the authority of Jesus, who alone has that authority. Salvation through Christ was replaced by the requirements of the church, human ideas. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, let's look at it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I hope you'll memorize this beautiful text. It is so full of God's grace and love for each of you and for me. We've been saved through faith, by grace, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. No one should boast about their salvation in and of themselves because it is a gift of God, not of yourself. Now, during this period of compromise, we're talking about this, this particular phase in Christianity. Simple faith was replaced for certain pagan practices like lighting candles, bowing down before images, worshiping the saints. My dear friends here in Indianapolis, who alone is worthy of worship. God himself. And so the church presumed to change God's laws, including the acceptance of idol worship and the neglect of the holy seventh day Sabbath. During this age of compromise, the pagans day of the sun replaced the Bible Sabbath. And many Christian leaders promoted Sunday, the first day of the week, to make Christianity more palatable, more acceptable to the pagans who were worshiping on the first day of the week, Sunday, or the venerable day of the sun. Christian history reveals this. You can go to any library and and you can look up these facts. The History of the Eastern Church, page 184, says, the retention of the old pagan name of Dias Solis for Sunday is in a great measure owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine, that emperor of the Roman Empire, to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. So understand, Satan's master strategy was to influence powerful church leaders to unite with powerful state leaders in the black horse period. And they compromised. That's what politicians do. The pagan Roman Emperor Constantine united with the Roman church in an attempt to unite his entire empire. You see, Sunday was a vehicle of unity. In a doctrinal catechism, page 174 of the third American edition, Stephen Keenan, the Catholic author of the catechism, which is written in a question and answer format, says the following. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree 
with her. She could not have substituted, get this, very important. Those of you in the balcony, here on the main floor, watching over live streaming, get this point. She could not have substituted, substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Now that's a pretty profound statement from someone explaining the catechism. You see, this individual, Mr. Keenan, makes the issue very plain. In those early centuries where the church and the state United, Sabbath was changed by the church at that time to Sunday. The church attempted to actually change God's law. And we've gone over that. The beautiful fourth commandment of the ten. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It attempted to change the Ten Commandments in a mixture of Christianity with paganism. Idol worship and Sunday worship were more acceptable to the pagans. So in the Black Horse period, the church grew large, but it lost its true spiritual power because it was not based on the Word of God, but rather on human tradition, on the ideas of individuals not inspired by God. A fourth seal opens, the pale horse. Now the Bible says in verse 8, So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. Now imagine it. A dead rider riding a horse that looks pale near death. And what does it say? And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. During this period, known as the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages of Earth's history. From A.D. 538 onward, the church grew large. It built beautiful cathedrals. Actually, to human glory and not to God's glory. You don't have to worship in a grand cathedral. You can worship in the simplest of churches, and God is there. But there was persecution of the true Bible-believing Christians. Church and state had united. The church was spiritually dead. Now here's an amazing statement, all right? Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity, as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed baptized paganism. So you substitute the pagan sun god's day for Sabbath, and that's baptized paganism. Seal number four, a dead faith. The white horse, pure faith. The red horse, Bloodstained faith, the black horse, compromised faith, the pale horse, a dead faith. So the four horsemen of the book of Revelation. You see, there was a union of church and state uh, during these Middle Ages. The decrees of the, of the church took the place of the plain, simple teachings of the word of God. Faithful Christians were chained during uh, the Dark Ages, and they were marched to the stake where they were burned as heretics for standing up 
for the pure word of God. During this particular period, the steps of compromise led the church downward. And this is instructive for us today in an age where everything seems to be falling apart. I don't know what news service you use. When I go to the service that I use every day, checking on things, finding out what's going on, it appears to me that the world is disintegrating before our very eyes. Social values, spiritual values, business ethics, violence, everything seems to be shaking. It's instructive for us to make sure that we do not personally participate in compromise. So what are these steps to compromise? Traditions. The traditions of human beings took the place of God's Word. Penances took the place of the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, if you do this, if you go up this, if you do this, if you pay this, if you... penance. You can somehow earn your way. No, my brothers and sisters, the only way, as this beautiful panel says over here on your left, the only way to salvation is to come to the foot of the cross and to kneel before Jesus. To accept his grace, not penance. Indulgences were introduced. That you could somehow pay money and buy your way out of purgatory. A supposed place. And let me tell you, it does not exist. A supposed place between hell and heaven. What an ingenious way to make money. The church developed this idea. Not the faithful church, but the compromised church. Images. Many compromises came into the church. The church hierarchy was substituted actually for God himself in many cases and they substituted the Son's Day for the Sabbath. Human dogmas replaced the clear teachings of God's Word. For centuries God's truth was cast down to the earth. Would God's truth be trodden down forever? Would the light of truth ever shine again? Would God's word ever be the foundation of the church again? Well, listen to this. The book of Jude is a very small book, a powerful book. And in verse 3, there's only one chapter in Jude, it's very, very close to the very end of the New Testament. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you, instructing you, helping you to understand, to contend earnestly, to, to guard, to protect, to, to, to work for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So this inspired writer indicates to us that the light of truth would shine once again. God would raise up courageous men and women who would be faithful to his holy word. One of these groups was named the Waldensians. They were Bible-believing Christians who lived in northern Italy on the western side of Italy and in southern France. In fact, my wife and I have had the privilege, maybe some of you have, of visiting that very region, Torre Pelleci, in the mountains of Italy. The popular church despised these godly believers. They were brutally persecuted and they fled into the mountains of the Alps. And there in hidden Waldensian villages and settings, Bible truth flourished. Some of the remnants of those villages are 
even present today, you can go and see them. This is where men and women who stood faithful to God's word lived long ago. They said, our mind is held captive to the word of God. So there's a secret Bible school where the Waldensian young people studied God's word. I've been there. It's, it's a sobering place. They made copies of the word of God. Then they were sent out to different countries in Europe and cities as students or peddlers, people who would be selling things. And as they found opportunity, they would leave these precious little fragments of the Word of God with someone they perceived was truly interested in Bible truth. The Waldensians restored the truth of the Bible and the Bible alone. They restored that truth that God's Word and God's Word alone must be obeyed. And God began to raise up a variety of men and women. There was Jan Hus, or John Hus, in Prague, in what is now the Czech Republic. He was a Catholic priest. He began to study the Word of God, and as he studied, he declared, obedience to God is my motto, not obedience to man. As a result, Jan Hus was burned at the stake. He was a courageous hero whose life was dedicated to obeying God. In fact, it is told that he died in the flames, singing glory to God. My dear friends here this morning, I believe with the Waldensians that the Bible and the Bible alone is our guide to truth not the traditions of the church. And I believe with John Huss or Jan Hus that obedience to God is our only motto. What do you say? God raised up another Catholic priest, a mighty man of God in faith, Martin Luther. As Martin Luther struggled with issues of faith, he visited Rome. Many of you may have been to Rome. You may have made a visit to Rome. In fact, you may have seen some of these amazing sights. When Martin Luther visited Rome, he sensed that guilt was crushing out his life. And in an attempt to find peace, he did many penances. You know, we just talked about penances, trying to do something to win favor with God, including climbing the famed Pilate's staircase on his knees. He thought, if I can climb these stairs, Jesus supposedly climbed when he approached Pilate, and I say supposedly because uh, that's Rome, and the stairs were not in Rome. Jesus wasn't in Rome. So anyway, we, we would just say supposedly, he says, I'll find peace. But when Luther returned home, he still felt this opposition, this, this horrid oppression of guilt. All of his pilgrimages and his penances, everything he tried to do hadn't taken away the feeling of unworthiness. Then, unfortunately, Martin Luther could read the Bible. In those days, Bibles were chained to the walls. In those days, most people could not read the Bible. Many of you at home today have several Bibles in your home. How often do you read them? Go to your Bible every day. Let the Bible change your life. But Martin Luther could read the Bible. He went to the Bible and he read in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by 
faith. Not by penances, not by climbing stairs on your knees, not by self-flagellation, beating yourself. No. Now in Acts 4, verse 12, we read, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So he saw Jesus anew as a mighty Savior. Luther was dumbfounded. He was amazed. And he experienced a new peace in his own personal life. I want to tell you, as I stand here on this platform, here in Indianapolis, I believe with Martin Luther that salvation comes not by the works of our own hand, not because of what we have done, but it comes because what Jesus did on the cross for us. I believe that salvation only comes by the grace of God. You see, the light of truth would penetrate the darkness just as it took 500 years for the church to go from the white horse of pure apostolic faith to the pale horse of spiritual deadness, it took time for God's faithful followers to grasp glimpses of truth lost sight of down through the ages. God would not switch on a light and have truth come down on our minds all at once. It took time. God gradually began to restore Bible truth in the 1300s and the 1400s with the Waldensian people, with John Huss, with Martin Luther, each bringing a particular understanding, adding to the collective pure truth of God to the people of God. Do you know now why there are so many denominations? Because the Waldensians stopped where they were. They said, the Bible and the Bible only is truth. But they didn't keep studying the doctrines of the Bible. Let me tell you, my dear friends, the doctrines of the Bible, that sounds so formal, that sounds kind of official. Let me tell you, every single doctrine of the church and of the Bible, according to the Bible, is based on the beautiful connection with Jesus Christ. Well, the Hussites said, obedience to God. But they didn't keep going. The Lutherans said, salvation by faith. Martin Luther has it all. But they didn't keep going. God raised up these good and these great men of God who had partial light, but not one of them had complete light. God raised up another man, John Calvin, in Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin emphasized the importance of Christian discipline and growth in grace. His followers became known as Presbyterians. Once again, a church is built around the teachings of a man God raised up. What each group failed to recognize, and this is an important point for you to consider, was that God was using different church leaders to restore varying aspects of Bible truth. John Robinson understood this principle. He was the pastor to the Puritan pilgrims who sailed the Mayflower to the New World, to this very country in which we are privileged to live. Unable to make the journey himself, he admonished them or instructed them as follows. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of his, be as ready to receive it as ever you were to receive any truth of my ministry. For I am very confident the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth out of his holy word. 
So God was leading a church over a period of centuries until further truth would be restored by a final body of believers at the end time. I'll tell you right now, I think that's where we are. The end time. This movement would be built on the shoulders of the reformers, but it would go way beyond the reformers and restore the entire truth lost sight of by a compromised church. Do you know that Martin Luther still believed in sprinkling babies? Infant baptism. It's contrary to the Bible, but it was part of Luther's creed. So, my friends, do you find sprinkling babies in the Bible? No, that's not in the Bible. It took the Baptists or the Anabaptist movement to understand Christ's words about baptism. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Not only baptize them, but teach them to observe. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. God raised up another man by the name of John Wesley. Wesley saw that the standards of the church were decaying. He saw that the amusements, the pleasures of attraction in the world and the practices were entering into the church. And so God raised up John Wesley and showed him that when men and women study the Holy Word of God, that they were to live righteous and holy lives by God's grace. I tell you, I believe in holiness, not through my own power, but through my connection with Jesus. I believe that the church should be separate from the influences of the world. I believe that if you are a Christian, you should look like a Christian, eat like a Christian, go places that Christians go to. Claiming to be a Christian, but drinking alcohol and indulging in worldly entertainment and dress, trying to look like the world is not true primitive Christianity. It's self-deception. There was another thing that was lost sight of that needed to be restored. And Pastor Finley preached that with such power this morning. The truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. God raised up a powerful preacher in the 19th century named William Miller. He was actually a farmer and he had a struggle to actually get to the point to proclaim what he was studying personally and privately. But God called him because God had a message to speak through him to proclaim the truth of the second coming of our Lord. And at this time, the church had largely neglected the second coming of Jesus. God raised up a whole new movement called the Adventists. People who looked to the advent, the coming of Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus is coming soon? I believe that too. So I'm an Adventist, all right? But there was one more important biblical truth that was not yet dis uh, restored at this time. The truth that faith leads to obedience to the commandments of God and the special truth regarding the seventh day Sabbath as the symbol of Christ's creative authority. Christ would raise up a last day movement. 
that would finally restore the truth about God's Ten Commandments in a time of commandment breaking, a last day movement that would take seriously God's instructions through Jesus Christ, the living word, as he pointed us to the written word. John 14 and verse 15, Jesus himself says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus would have a last day movement in the last days of earth's history where I have just told you I believe that's where we are. It would be outlined in the book of Revelation. God would call all humanity all over this globe back to worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water to worship God in a pure way turning people back to the true worship of God God would call all of us back to the truths of the Bible God would call all humanity back to accept the Sabbath as a symbol of his creative authority. It is a sign, a seal that God places on his people when they are faithful to him, just as the martyrs were during that period of the bloody, red-stained period of time. God calls us to be faithful. In an age of evolution, God would restore the truth about creation and the Bible Sabbath. After all, the Sabbath came at the end of the six days of creation. Not long ages and periods, but six literal days. God would have a group of people that would restore the truths that were lost sight of in the dark ages. The Bible's last book, Revelation, identifies this group of people. Where are God's people? Verse 12 of that magnificent chapter of Revelation 14. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those, and it's not talking about saints that you might think, oh, these are unbelievable people who were, you know, they have statues of them and all. No, the saints are the people of God, all right? And it says, here is the patience of the saints or the people of God at the end time. Here are those who keep, the, here, two points now. We, we, we emphasize this recently, but get them in your minds. Those who keep the commandments of God, that's number one, and the faith of Jesus. God would have a group of people that had total faith in Jesus and accepted the whole Bible as his word of truth in the last days of Earth's history. He would have a group of people that keep his commandments because they love him supremely and are faithfully worshiping the Creator each Bible Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week. God would have a called out people, men and women from every nation, from every race. Today we even saw a beautiful example of it in the two choirs that were singing. Men and women of every language group, a called out people. I want to tell you, my friends, here in Indianapolis and around the world, I'm a Waldensian. Because I believe that the Bible and the Bible alone is the basis of our faith. In a sense, I'm a, a Hussite, a follower of John Huss or Jan Hus, because I believe in the obedience to God as our only motto. And in a sense, I, I'm a Lutheran, because I believe in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And in a sense, you know, I'm a Presbyterian because I believe in the organization of the church as taught by the Bible. And in a sense, I'm a Baptist because I believe in baptism by immersion, as you have witnessed 
today and last night and will in just a few moments. And in a sense, I'm a Methodist because I believe that God has called us to holiness, not perfection by our own efforts, but looking to Jesus who can change the heart of stone into a heart of flesh, a heart that throbs for him. And I'm an Adventist Amen. because I believe in the soon second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, you all know by now, I am a Seventh-day Adventist because I believe in the Bible of the seventh day. And I believe that God has a movement in the book of Revelation to which he is calling men and women. He is calling every single one of you, no matter how old, no matter what background, no matter if you're in the balcony or here on the main floor, no matter where you are around the world, he is calling you to be faithful. You see, today God is doing something unusual. He's gathering people in his last day movement around this globe. Hundreds and thousands of people sense that this is God's time to restore all the truths that have been lost sight of down through the ages as we have revealed and re reviewed those four horsemen and the periods of time. This is God's word that tells us about those periods. You see, these people in the last days, they're accepting God's truth. They're walking into the water to be baptized. Don't worry, when you're baptized, the pastor doesn't hold you down in the water. He doesn't make you afraid. And in fact, someone, a very kind person, has made that water warm. Sometimes people are baptized in frigid water, in rivers, in lakes, but they do it because they want to be one with Christ, and it doesn't matter what they have to go through. But today, we have three more precious people who will be baptized in warm water before you, but going down into the watery grave and coming up a new creature in Jesus Christ. They're following. They're following Jesus Christ. They do not want a denomination that is based on human understanding that only comes partway out of error and traditions of the past. They want to go all the way with Jesus, to walk in his beautiful truth. My dear friends here in Indianapolis, I believe God has brought every single one of you into this auditorium and during this week and previous weeks in different places in Indianapolis as the Word of God has been preached he's brought you to these meetings for a purpose and those of you who will be following up in later meetings and Pastor Finley passed out that beautiful sheet of paper where additional meetings will be taking place avail yourselves of those meetings don't stay away God has truth for you God wants to work in your life today God is saying to you my child this is your moment of destiny this is your time of opportunity follow the truth would you like to say to Jesus, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the Bible truth that is being restored. Thank you for the word of God. I want to drink it in. I don't just want to listen to lectures from Pastor Wilson or Pastor Finley or some other pastor. I want to dig into the word myself. I want you to reveal to me full truth. I want to ask that you carefully consider that appeal. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a stand for Jesus, all of you. 
And in particular, those of you who would like to be baptized and join God's precious people at the end of time, you'll have that opportunity in just a few moments. But right now, we're going to be witnessing one of the most spectacular events in the history of those who are baptized an opportunity to publicly testify before all of you that Jesus is the supreme Lord of their lives and God wants you to make that decision as well Pastor Finley Pastor Noel stands in the baptismal pool with Johnny Lopez Johnny's story is really an amazing story. Johnny knew Christ and knew the divine truths of his word, but Johnny drifted away. For 15 long years, he wandered from Christ in the world. But all that time, he sensed the convicting power of God's word. And as he did, he was gradually led back to Jesus met Pastor Noel, attended some meetings with Pastor Noel, is here today to seal this decision for Christ. But here's the good news. When you come to Jesus like this, the love of God bubbles up in your heart. He is now studying the Bible with another brother, trying to help him get ready for baptism. He's actively involved in the church and is preparing to be a deacon in the church. So Pastor Wilson and I, Pastor Noel, we raise our hands to heaven. We will pronounce the blessing over him in English, but I want you to pronounce it in Spanish because I want him to hear it in his own tongue. My dear brother, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Johnny, you are home now. You are clean now. In Jesus, in part God of God's you, last you. day, grab, grab people. Over there. I've decided to follow Jesus, Charles. I've oh, decided. To follow Join in Charles Jesus. with Charles as he sings. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me. The cross before the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, and the cross before me. no turning back, no turning back. Pastor Tunde has walked into the baptismal pool with Rachel. This young lady is an amazing young lady. She's extremely intelligent. Some of you may be aware that she just received the Heroes Award in the city of Indianapolis. Mm, an amazing young woman. What took place is there was a medical emergency in her home. That medical emergency could have caused a death. Her grandmother didn't speak English. When 911 was called, this young girl at nine years old took charge. She quietly and deliberately and intelligently walked the 911 operator through the steps that were taking place, stayed on the phone till the emergency crews arrived and a life was saved. She's been constantly desirous of giving her life to Jesus, to following him. You have received the Heroes Award, Rachel, from the city of Indianapolis. Today, in heaven, your name is written down 
and you are receiving the Heroes Award from Jesus Christ our Lord in your baptism. Amen. Amen. So we lift our hands to heaven. And Pastor Tunde now baptizes Rachel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, no one joined me. God bless you. Still God I bless will you. follow. <laughs> Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have to say to everyone, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, praise God, no turning back. Judins. This young man is 14 years old. Isn't it amazing to see teenagers come to Christ? When many teenagers Amen. today are in the world, to see these young people come to Jesus, to see them commit their lives to Jesus, to see them follow Jesus is the most wonderful thing in the world. Now the interesting thing about Judins is that he is a witness for Christ. He's a positive influence in his school, positive influence among other young people. So, Judens, Pastor Wilson, Pastor Tunde, and I lift our hands to heaven. God is smiling at you today. The Bible says, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. When Jesus was baptized, the Father spoke. And I believe all heaven is smiling at you. The angels are smiling at you. They're saying, this is my beloved son, Judas, in whom I am well pleased. So we raise our hands to heaven and we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I have decided. God bless you, Julius. You made a great, great decision. Jesus. God bless you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. God's Spirit is moving on hearts no and lives. People are making decisions to follow Christ. They're walking through the water of baptism. Pastor Noel walks into the baptismal pool with, with Sonia. Dear Pastor, praise God for the work you have done with this sister. She comes from a Haitian background. Sometimes in life there are hurts. Sometimes in life there are heartaches. Sometimes in life we drift from what we know we ought to do. And this sister has said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be clean. I want my past to be cleansed. I want a new life in Christ. She's part of the Philadelphia SDA Church and my dear sister, Pastor Noel, Pastor Wilson, and I raise our hands to heaven. Our dear Haitian pastor, raise his hands to heaven. And Sister Sonia, because you love Christ, you want to follow him. You believe that you have found God's people on earth today, the Adventist faith and community. You want to be part of that church that Pastor Wilson talked about that's going around the world. We raise our hands to heaven. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Que Dieu vous bénisse. Que Dieu vous bénisse. Que Dieu vous bénisse. Wow. Bon démon. Amen. What a marvelous experience to see people take a stand for Jesus. People who want to be part of that great triumphal horse 
that marches across the sky with Jesus seated on that horse of triumph. God is calling people from every corner of this globe, everywhere. God is calling people to come back to the true worship of God, his precious Bible truth. Jesus is coming very soon. He's calling for you, every one of you. Whether you've been baptized or not, he's calling you to make a stand for him, to be willing to stand for truth faithfully honoring him through his power no matter what you may face. The challenge is coming. The book of Revelation tells us a time when people will not be able to buy or sell unless they have a particular mark. Let me tell you that mark is not the mark from God. It is a mark from human beings. But those who keep God's precious Seventh-day Sabbath, who honor his commandments, who have the testimony and the faith of Jesus, will receive God's seal, which is the Seventh-day Sabbath. And they will be one with him. It will be difficult, but God asks us to stand firm for him today wherever you are, in the balcony, on the main floor, even watching over live streaming, how many of you would like to say, yes, Lord, I want to stand for Bible truth. I want to stand for those truths which have been lost in the past, but they're right here in the Word of God. I want to stand for you. Help me with all the power of heaven to take a stand for you in this time and the future. I'm appealing to all of you. How many of you would like to say, yes, Jesus, let me stand on your side. Would you stand to your feet right now? Amen. <clears throat> Beautiful. <clears throat> older ones, younger ones, men and women. What a powerful witness for Bible truth, for Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Thank you. To those in the balcony also, you're part of this. Don't think you're separated because of a little space. You're part of this. Now I'm going to ask in a very special way. There are a number of you who have already indicated you would like to be baptized by immersion as you have seen today. You've indicated that on your cards. I want you to carefully think and pray about this. But even more than that, I would like to ask you, wherever you are, whether or not you have even marked on that card, whether the Lord has spoken to your heart right now, anyone, anywhere, if you have not been baptized or you would like to be rebaptized because you've learned new truth at the Revelation of Hope series, any one of you who would like to take that public stand for Jesus and you've marked on the card or maybe right now you're just impressed would you raise your hand right now, wherever you are? Anyone who would like to be baptized, God will see you. A little difficult for me to see in the, in the lights here, but God will see you. Is there someone here, those who have marked their cards? I'd like you to come and meet me at the front of this auditorium. And those in, this, in the balcony, just come down the aisle those who would like to signify, yes, Lord, I want to be baptized. As Charles sings, I will follow thee, my Savior. Those of you who would like to be baptized, come down to the front. God bless you. God bless you, brother, sister. Amen. Charles. <laughs> I will follow thee, my Savior, whatsoever my lot may be. Where thou goest, 
I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I'll follow Thee. I will follow Thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed Thy blood for me. And though all men should forsake Thee, by Thy grace I'll follow Thee. Praise God for those who have come forward. Praise God for those who are making their decision. You are making the most important decision of your life. God will reward you for this. Not only with mansions in heaven, not only with a cleaner, happier life, not only with something that will give you true meaning in life, but eventually you will be with Jesus. Charles, sing one more. Though the road Anyone else? be rough and Anyone else? thorny, would like to come and sing the as the they want to follow sea. Jesus. I am, you have trod this come down road before me, and I gladly follow thee. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me, and though all men should forsake thee. By thy grace, I follow thee. Praise be to oh, God. I what a wonderful decision. God bless you, my dear brother. So what a privilege. Tempted. Is there another one? God oh, bless you, sister. Be. Praise be to God. Is there another? The Lord will come into your heart and reward you for this. Is there another? Another who would like to come. The Lord is touching your heart right now, and he wants you to fully stand on his side, publicly demonstrating, I am part of God's last day people. God bless each one of you, sisters and brothers who have come down here. Brothers and sisters in Jesus. Is there one more? Charles, sing one more stanza. Though I meet with tribulations, sorely tempted though I may be, I remember thou was tempted, and I rejoice to follow thee. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me, and though all men should forsake thee, by thy grace I follow thee, by thy grace I follow Thank you, Charles. Another one? Okay. Oh, praise God, we have another sister who would like to come but can't come because she can't move. We praise God for that. What a wonderful privilege. By thy grace, I'll follow thee. Every one of us wants to participate in that beautiful process of grace and faith and growing in Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, and I can see that the Lord has touched your hearts. You're emotional because this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. It revolves around eternal values and eternity itself. Praise God for your giving your heart and your life to Jesus. Let me pray with you. Loving Father, thank you 
for the movement of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of these men and women. We thank you that even one who has come up is carrying her little son. Lord, one of these days, if you tarry and don't come immediately, we want you to, this little child will have that opportunity of following in his mother's footsteps of giving his heart to Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you cover our lives with grace regardless of how old we are. You know the intents of our hearts. You know that we want to follow you. And now bless these who have made commitments. Thank you for the baptisms that have taken place today, for the baptism that will take place tonight, for those baptisms that will continue to take place all across Indianapolis in the coming weeks. People who are studying the Word of God, becoming convicted of last day Bible truth. Truth that has existed down through the centuries but is being discovered by people because they're not looking to human tradition but they're looking to your holy word. Now Lord, we ask that you will keep each one of these who has made a decision today. Those who have made them on the cards, those who have come down to the front, that you will keep them protected from the devil Keep them in your way, and may they be mighty witnesses for you. Thank you for hearing us in this prayer, and for the promise that Jesus is coming soon, when all of us who have followed you will be united on that sea of glass in heaven, of which we will talk about tonight, about heaven itself. And we will be there to listen to the words of Jesus, not for one time, but for eternity. In Jesus' precious name we ask it, amen. Please be seated. God bless each one of you. God bless you. God bless you.